at all. In early 2007, I was living in Bromley, South East London. That's when I first stumbled upon Rocky Frisco. I was researching the roots of some of my musical heroes, and Rocky Frisco cropped up because he'd been playing music with J.J. Kale on and off since 1957. And for me, J.J. Kale is right up there with John Lee Hooker and Bob Dylan as one of my main influences. So I decided to approach Rocky. You know, I don't remember the details. It was a, an internet thing. Just sent me an email or whether it was a message on MySpace. Or, but contacted me and was mostly talking about Kale and his music. And I went and listened to some of his songs. And uh, I wrote him back, you know, and just told him it was, uh, incredible material. Man. I just became an enormous fan overnight. And that's what this friendship is, where it grew out of. It's hard to describe what I felt when Rocky Frisco wrote back to me and said he seriously liked my song. I mean, here's a guy who's been playing some of my favorite music for over 50 years. Immediately, I began thinking about visiting Rocky Frisco to learn as much as I could from him. For a European songwriter like me, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. It's a chance to understand my own musical roots better. We basically said, come ahead, you know, we've got a spare room. And he's been coming back every year since. You know, a lot of, if he decides to do something, then he'll do it. As far as I can tell, when, when we bounced off each other, he was so discouraged, he was about ready to just give that up and, and try to start a new life in some other form of creativity. After only 10 years of writing songs and working in contemporary bands, I sensed time had become my enemy. I was one of the factors that caused him to, to, go, to go ahead and to still be sticking with it, still without any real reward or recognition out of it. But, but it's just really important to me that he continue to do what he's doing. Rocky had a huge impact on me. From the very beginning, despite our 40-year age difference, he treated me as an equal. He welcomed me into his inner sanctum and introduced me to an extraordinary community of musicians who have changed my life forever. I'm sure a lot of probably knows a lot more about my background now than I know about his, because I talk too much and he doesn't. Rocky's a great storyteller. And over the years, I think he must have recounted to me a thousand anecdotes about his life. From riding a bicycle for seven days to interview Elvis Presley, to tales of singing the blues over his ex-wives, racing cars in Canada, and performing in Carnegie Hall. I think I know him pretty well now. Now he's really kind of soaked up the Tulsa sound and the Tulsa feel, and that's starting to get into his material more and more. Uh, people here in town that come to hear our music just love him. The town resonates with a living, tangible sound so reminiscent of my favorite old records. Finding out about the Tulsa sound gave me a totally new perspective on where some of my favorite music comes from and how it was made. So much so that I decided very early on that this was something that must be documented. Rocky Frisco was around at the very beginning when the Tulsa sound was invented. And when a guy's been around like that and played that much music, it gives you a little bit of credibility. Part of the Tulsa sound isn't the sound at all. It's the attitude that the various players have toward each other. Tulsa had the western swing, and it had the country, and it had the blues, too. So it's, and the gospel, it's all a whole mixture. It's just, like cooking up a stew. <laughs> I'm surprised to discover that the Tulsa sound is attributed not only to J.J. Kale, but also to Leon Russell and British musicians, such as Eric Clapton. The Tulsa sound comes out initially, the classic Tulsa sound, comes out of the clubs. The, essentially the illegal clubs that were around here in the 50s. It's non-definable. It's more of a some kind of cosmic thing. The real family, those guys grew up together, you know, Leon and Carstein and Jimmy Markham and Chuck Blackwell, and you know the list is long. They started recording in Oklahoma, and it's it's that family. So what's the Tulsa sound? I don't know. It's sort of that. Kale and uh, 
I think Clapton had already cut his tune, but he was back in town and he wasn't doing much. And he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I want to start my own band. I never had my own band before. He says, well, what kind of band are you going to have? I said, well, I want, to do, I want to do country music, but I want to play like we play. And he said, man, I like to play in that band. I said, OK. So we went looking for a place to play some country music with blues kind of guitars. For a brief shining moment, Tulsa was the epicenter of the rock and roll scene. I mean, you watch this concert from Bangladesh, and here's Leon and the boys, and then here's George Harrison, and then, uh, you know, who else used to come through? Clapton, of course, got his band from here in the 70s. Listen to Clapton before he came to Tulsa, and then listen to him after. I just very well thought that Tulsa might someday rule the music world with the, all the abilities of the players. And, but I was young and naive, and. And we did do, we did influence it to a pretty major degree. It's incredible to me that these guys are playing empty bars. Here's a little tune we'd like to send out to, uh, would you guys know any girls? Any girls <laughs> Meeting these legendary players like Don White, David Teagarden, and many others makes me wonder how many Rocky Friscos there are in America. A whole generation of these guys is gradually passing away, and often they're remembered only by family members, friends, and fellow local musicians. A sense of injustice has inspired me to document my findings in Tulsa. You know, I can, I can play with one of these bands I love and work hard all night, four, four and a half, five hours even, and make 50 bucks. And that's what we made here 25, 30 years ago. So, and you should be able to live all week on that 50 bucks. Not now. You know. uh, there, before the fuel prices came back down, you just about paid to get to the gig and home. That's what you made. We all love to play. We would all play for nothing if there was no other alternative. But if you do that, well then, all the, the club owners start thinking they can get everybody to play for free. And there's no union or anything like that anymore, so the, the bands have to kind of stick together to keep their, their values up to keep everybody else making a living, too. In recent years, Rocky Frisco introduced me to many great musicians and songwriters in Tulsa. But few will leave such a lasting impression on me as Tom Skinner. Sure, yeah, I'm for it. I'm going to, I'll hand you back to a lot of here. Hello, Tom. So does it look like we've got a confirmation? I've met some great rhythm and blues players like Kevin Ferris, Steve Pryor, and Scott Ellison. 
But it's at Rocky's Wednesday night gig that my search for the Tulsa sound will finally unearth some red dirt. so much. Sean Rick by my good buddy Randy Pease, who uh, used to know back in the old Stillwater days, a great songwriter. Story about the old tent preachers that used to travel the country spreading the gospel. Called the Sawdust Trail. Where is Rocky? Is he in here? Yeah, come on up, Rocky, help us out on this, would you? We said, hey, man, how about we do this? How about if we'll play every week, I think on a Wednesday night, I said, and we'll have a different guest every week. I said, it might be a songwriter, it might not, it might be a whatever. It might be a piano player, it might be a whatever. We first got the idea of this, we thought, boy, it's going to take a lot of work to work this guest stuff up every week. To... So then we thought, you know, let's just be lazy and we'll not do it. We'll just get them up there and jam and see what happens, and we'll just call it Science Project and see what goes on. So that's kind of how it started, just call it the Wednesday Night Science Project. And we kind of made a rule, no practice. And over the years, I've watched it grow. Tom Skinner introduced me in amongst the Red Dirt people, so, and they just, you know, opened their arms. The Science Project musicians make me realize that their music, just like mine, is more about the lyrics and the story they tell. In a sense, they themselves are documentary makers. Their songs are living, breathing testimony to the experiences of that time, and as such, keep their people's histories burning bright. He was born out on the prairie, he was living with his hand. Five o'clock in the morning finds him working on his land. Let the start of the Great Depression, 1929. The lines in his face tell the story of the struggle to survive. The wind started blowing, blew that farm away. He told his woman, I got to do something, make it through another day. Yeah, it was a model to outlaw by the year of 31. He told my son someday I'm gonna have to pay for the wicked things I've done. He told my son someday I'm gonna have to pay for the wicked things I've done. Oklahoma is an odd combination of early day life. This was at one time officially or unofficially called outlaw territory. It was officially Indian territory. This is the home of cowboys and Indians. At one time, it was so rough in here, federal marshals would gather over across the border in Arkansas or somewhere and come in after outlaws that were hiding out in this area, outlaw country. Some say he was a good man, some say he was a thief. But all the tales they told about him never could believe. City Rock Bank in Dallas, on a cold November day But I swear he was home with mama 300 miles away My grandfather had, had uh, would get a regular check from the oil company. They were going to, they were not wealthy by any stretch of the imagination, they were poor. But when they went into town, if they got a tin of lard for themselves, they got a tin of lard for the next door neighbor. If they got a sack of flour for themselves, they got a sack of flour with the next door neighbor because the next door neighbor was a farmer. And had they not bought food for those people, they would have died. In Oklahoma, we went through not just the Great Depression, but we went through the Dust Bowl. We had a double whammy in the 1930s. This music is like a crash course in American history to me. And I'm beginning to understand that all the blood that has been spilt in Oklahoma and all the hardship and desperation that the farming communities have experienced here created an oaky spirit. A strange and surprising mix of generosity, self-reliance, and spirituality. I think all of that has to do with, with the music that we make and that, that Oklahoma makes and Red Dirt music and, and Tulsa music, uh, too, because it's, um, it's that mixture of, of all that stuff that, that becomes our roots. A lot of emotions that have come out of hard living, 
uh, knowing where your parents came from and what they went through and, you know, your family history, your, your culture. One of my things that I'm kind of known for is writing history type songs. I have a song called A Little Rain Will Do, which is basically, you know, I was lucky enough growing up that I knew my grandparents. My grandparents on both sides were farmers during the Great Depression here in America. And, and my grandfather would tell these stories over and over about the drought years and, and how hard it was. And stuff. So I sit down and wrote this song. That's kind of a Woody Guthrie-ish song. Uh, Woody Guthrie just wrote folk songs, and folk songs were about people. You know, they're about folks. It goes back to Woody Guthrie and, uh, you know, Jimmy Rogers and, you know, that kind of songwriting where you're, you're talking about what's going on. It's a song about nothing, nothing at all. There ain't a nickel's worth the difference in Kansas and Nebraska. Lots of wide open spaces Every now and then a tree I suppose if you were born around there Then you might beg to differ Yeah, but I'm from Oklahoma And it all looks pretty much the same to me Roger Maris, he was the man. He hit more home runs than anyone. And I don't understand why the commissioner put an asterisk in the record book by his name. He was a hero to me and he was steroid free. They ought to be ashamed. Oh, So I'm driving north on 99 and it's raining cats and dogs And the cars and trucks they pass me like I'm standing still Yeah, but just like a herd of turtles, I push onward through the bog Turning my mountains into little bitty bowls During the 1930s, there were two great musical forces in Oklahoma, and their influence is as alive today as ever. The names Woody Guthrie and Oklahoma are forever inseparable, whilst Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys were for many years based in Tulsa. All right, my name is Johnny Cubiello, born in Fresno, California, and uh, 1915, 8, 8, 15. And I took up drums in high school from the teacher, instructor. The big band came through, that, and Bob Wills' band came through, and I didn't know Bob Wills or Tommy Duncan. And I went up to the drummer, I said, I'm a drummer. He said, oh good, will you mind tuning my drum up? And I didn't know he was Bob Wills' brother. So I tuned him up, I said, well, I'll tune him up my way. He said, go ahead. He wanted to go back to the upright bass, so he played bass. And so he was glad that he could get out of there and I took the drum. Bob walked in with Tommy Duncan. I didn't know Bob or Tommy. They had civilian hats. So Bob got on the, on the microphone with a cigar in his mouth. He says, are you ready, boys? Man, I, I was surprised. Da, 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 and we took off. And I played all the songs that he, he carried in. And he says, you want to work with me? I says, yeah, I think I do. I said, I have no boots and I have no hat. He says, we'll take care of all that. And that's how I got hired with Bob Wells. Of course, Tulsa was like a hub of uh, Western swing. You know, when you had Bob Wills here at Canes and, you, and you've got uh, Leon McAuliffe later on over at the Cimarron, but Canes just brings back a lot of memories for me. <laughs> 
Bob Wells was the top band in the nation one time in the 40s. Bigger than Harry James or Benny Goodman or either the Dorseys, the top dance band in the nation was Bob Wills, dance band, Bob Wills, Texas Playboys. Um, Woody Guthrie never achieved that kind of success financially, um, but look at the influence that he had as a songwriter. Childers was a big Woody Guthrie fan. Jimmy LaFave is a big Woody Guthrie fan. I like Woody Guthrie. So, you know, it goes back, for, it goes from Woody Guthrie to Dylan, you know, to Arlo, Arlo Guthrie. I feel closer than ever before to the roots of the great American songwriting tradition. Sure, I was a big fan of J.J. Cale and early 70s rock and roll, and I knew what a strong influence Woody Guthrie had on Bob Dylan, but I never imagined that these roots could be traced beneath such deep musical foundations. It has something to do with singer-songwriter, and words that are have a message in it. Sure, you can have lead guitars, and so you can have solos and stuff, but there's something about it being acoustic, along with your fiddle and your mandolin. There's that jam band sound mixed right. in with folk rock, mixed in with rock and roll. There's It's something to do with song, singer song and the message and the friendship. And, and that's it's, that's all you can say. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a total camaraderie thing like yourself. I mean, anybody I think that, that comes around here and sees that and I think whether or not you like it you become part of it yeah. to me the red dirt has always been more of a social thing than as a music thing because there's so many different people that have so many different sounds but yet we're all red dirt when we come together I mean you see us hugging each other and it's a brotherhood so I mean to really define it musically would be tough, but the Tulsa sound does have a very distinct sound, which I think is part of, you know, the Red Dirt, I guess, sound. One thing about the Red Dirt scene, I think if it is going to th th thrive and keep going, we don't need a gatekeeper. We don't need somebody to decide, oh, you're Red Dirt and you're not. If you, or if you hear something that music, this music that, that you like and you want to be part of it, hey, come on. Get you some of it, because that's the only way that it's going to keep going. The map we had was clear, the road was but a trail. No bridge to get across, no wheels to speed us up but for our faith. And I would wait for you, but I cannot pretend. Clouds drew in, I saw you turn around and look for an escape. Well, you made me feel like light years away. It's like a family. Somebody gets in trouble, you know. My wife had cancer and she passed away a few years ago, but they threw a benefit, you know, to help with the medical expenses. You know, the Rangers crashed on a helicopter. We did several benefits. Well, I'm John Cooper. Hey, and I'm Brad Piccolo, and we're two-thirds of the Red Dirt Rangers. Yes, we are. I guess nobody told him about the Buddy Holly thing. <laughs> and I mean, all the, all the plane crashes and stuff, you know, you, if you're in a band, just don't get on an airplane unless you have to, you know. Especially don't take any helicopter joy rides. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we're lucky to have them, you know. And they've been, a, you know, a big ambassador for Red Dirt music, traveling around, spreading the word and everything. So. Follow me down to the station, follow me down to the tracks, leave your sins and jump on in, this train ain't coming back, ain't no time for hesitation, got a brand new destination, just believe, the gospel train's gonna set you free. Our scene seems to get lumped in with country, but I just don't think that's what it is. It's a different thing than that. And we love country music, don't get me wrong. But, you know, we want to we want to be a blues band and a rock band and a country band and a, and a western swing band and a jazz band. And, and, a, and sometimes when that people call us to, to uh, book us for a show, like say if it's a, a blues festival and they say, well, are you a blues band? And we'll say, yeah, man, sure. we're a blues band. Or if we get a call from a country festival, 
Yeah, we're a country band, man. I mean, so. Follow me out of the valley. Follow me into the light. One road brings salvation. One brings endless night. There ain't no time for hesitation. Got a brand new destination. Just believe. The road to glory gonna set you free. Visiting the rangers in Pawnee County is a leap of faith into rural Oklahoma. Amongst other things, they also tell me some more stories about Randy Crouch, a mystery man I've heard so much about, but never actually met. This time, I'm determined to hunt him down. Yeah, Randy plays fiddle and steel with us in Red Dirt Rangers. He also does his own band. We can't describe Randy. <laughs> There's no way to describe Randy. Man, you're gonna have to take this camera right here and you have to go talk to Randy. And then you'll get Randy. Randy is a woodsman. He heard this fiddle, this the story I heard, and he spent a weekend with a fiddle and learned how to play it over the weekend. Amen, brother. So, you know, it's just comes to him, I guess. Yeah, he has he's, he just he plays the field. He plays from here. Which a lot of the red dirt artists, that's that's where they play from. So. That's what I like about it. <laughs> so the directions was um, by the old shut up sign, right? Yep. It's too bad, it's too bad, it's too bad, it ain't too good. Things didn't work out the way you wish wow. they would. It's too bad. Too bad it ain't too good. Hey, how you doing? Good. 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 If I could just get more solar panels and more wind generators, yeah. maybe a radio station. <laughs> this would come on in. This is like the first model. And, uh, this is four of the hexagons here together. And this will be three. They're a little different size of hexagons. But when I did this, I was thinking about the Great Pyramid, and I took the dimensions of it and uh, took the sides of the pyramid and domed them out. Okay. So it's a scale model of the <laughs> Great Pyramid. I had too many things to <laughs> think about. It. I had to figure it all out. This is really Really, really cool. I think I know what I did now, but... So how long have you been out here? Oh, like, all your life? Or? That's a good question. <laughs> Better ask Liz. <laughs> Anything about... I used to think nobody's gonna come back to the woods and discover me. I guess y'all just did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> we, we won't tell anybody how to go. Right. <laughs> He's been found out now. Can you explain to me what, I mean, uh, this is not, I mean, I don't want to question you, like, too intensely, but can you explain to me, I'm like a foreign songwriter, what is Red Dirt music, please? Yeah, that's a good question, uh, and two, I've thought about that a lot, and man, it, it's one of the coolest movements I've ever been a part of, and I'm still trying to understand that myself, really, it's Way bigger than what I thought it was at first, and probably big, I'm way bigger than what I know it is now. It's a good way to describe the music I like, because you know it doesn't have any boundaries. Yeah, it's kind of got a lot of room to grow still. Mm -hmm. It's cosmic. 
While Liz Crouch is cooking some bacon and beans for us, Randy makes it clear to me that red dirt music is not a genre. It's an eclectic blend of tradition and innovation that refuses to be classified. That's what I like about it. There's blues red dirt bands, there's country red dirt bands, there's rock red dirt. Yeah, you don't and, have to be any sort of what. Uh, I always thought it was supposed to be like that. It's got to get a little red dirt on you. <laughs> That's right, Virgil. But in what way is the music different? And why is it so different from other stuff you hear? Even though it's the same style, but different. Maybe it's because it incorporates everything. And I think there's like a place for everybody in it. Mm -hmm. You know, like I've always said, we're all in the same band, the rest is bullshit. <laughs> yeah. And in yeah. Red Dirt Music, man, everybody plays together, writes together. It's a big, big world, a lot of empty places. Just enough to go. nothing like being on a stage with your friends playing sometimes it just feels so uh kind of holy it does get four yeah, or five people that. together and and you're all making music and it's just like sometimes you might feel like crying you're so happy you know that's it's a weird deal but it kind of works like that it's uh you kind of bond with everybody. Once you play music with them, it's 
it almost like having sex. You know, really good friends. Well, there's no point in telling you where I come from. Things I do are wasted on the minds of those who've traveled some. How it should be, what people should It's never far from how they brought you up My mother's cooking better than you know I heard that fado late at night Made flamenco sound both hard and light My dreams go off in French, sometimes it's true Ain't had a job in years I've seen some people cry a lake of tears Security for me Loving you. I see them hippie birds. They know something we don't. Maybe we can fly. They don't have to pay. I used to think about the things that people think. And all they do is think. Now I'm thinking all that thinking is a disease. It's really why no, nobody tries to compete or thinks they're better than anybody else. We're all just really good friends and are happy for each other and just really excited to be playing with each other. And it's all due to folks like this, the older guys in the red dirt scene, that makes it special. The fact you're here means you've done something right. The universe keeps letting you back in. Right, right. Before I've messed up my own songs that I'm supposed to know. Well, I, I, you know kids, human. little kids come up to me. You messed <laughs> up your words. <laughs> I, I mean, I gotta, no, I changed them tonight. That's the way it goes tonight. As you can tell from watching him perform, man, every ounce of his being is in the music. It just is. He just loses himself in it, and it's so fun to play with him. So every year I'd go to Winfield, so I'd get up there, I'd look Crouch up, you know. And uh, so it was one year I'd gone up there, and I was looking for him, and I finally found him, and he's sitting on a bench, and he's working on his fiddle, which he's always working on his fiddle, if you know him. He's always trying to keep it together, you know. And, I mean, he'd been at Winfield a few days. There was mud and twigs and, you know, stuff from bird's nests. He's winding around to make it all work, you know, and he gets it all put together. And we play for about two or three days. And we're on some wild bluegrass space jam fiddle, and all of a sudden his fiddle just, poof, it just explodes and bursts apart like this. And he goes, damn! It always sounds best right before it goes, you know. <laughs> it's it just the mud and the twigs that just had all they could think of it, you know, and exploded. But yeah, he's something else. Randy Crouch, in his own way, is the perfect embodiment of Oklahoma's red dirt music. Proficient in a wide variety of musical styles, he is held together by sheer determination, spontaneity, and an impassioned sense of brotherhood that runs through the whole Red Dirt family.
Hello, Bobbies. <laughs> the truly amazing thing about this journey so far is that every time I think I've met a unique individual, another crops up to make me question and then abandon my preconceived notions about Red Dirt music, leaving me ever more enchanted by the multiple layers and the depth of the Red Dirt music roots. Bob Childers was one such individual, and the impact of his music on the whole music community has been profound. In 2007, I allowed an opportunity to meet Bob Childers slip from my grasp. For me at that time, he was just another name amongst many. Sadly, Bob died in 2008, two weeks before I returned to Oklahoma. Failing to meet him has been my only regret in this entire mission so far. Been on airplanes, been on oceans, I've seen both sides. generation in Red Dirt Music honored him and by playing his songs and talking about him and you know I think we all just wanted to take care of him like he was our grandpa or like he's our dad you know so we'd take him places and go visit him and he couldn't get out very much and at the end he really could barely walk down the steps of his trailer so he was a little bit older than us and sort of you know, was a guy we looked up to as an example of the right songs, you know. And then once we sort of got to the age where we graduated more or less, he went and grabbed the generation under us, which is the Medicine Shows and the McClure's and those kind of guys, and brought them along. And then underneath them, there's the Bolins and the Stonies that he sort of also schooled. He was always sort of a um, figurehead, you might say. For the, the whole thing, somebody to look up, somebody to somebody to aspire to. I'd like to write a song like that someday. Childers is one of those guys who I think, and I think it's already started to happen, who is going to be more famous after his death than he was. I mean, he was. I know that up until a few years before he died, he was still living pizza to make a living. The songs really are the currency of Red Dirt music. They are graciously shared and performed with pride by this close community of musicians. And I think it's safe to say that you can always sense Bob Childers' presence at a Red Dirt concert because he lives on through his songs and the eternal voices of his friends. Welcome to Folk Salad Certified Organic Music. I'm Scott Acock. And I'm Richard Higgs, and we have got more musicians in here than you can shake a stick at. That's true. Uh, we, we're doing a tribute to Bob Childers tonight, and a lot of his uh, friends, and, and really I would call them family as well, mm -hmm. uh, are in the room tonight. And so uh, they're going to be playing some songs and uh, rendering some stories about Bob. Uh, so we want to welcome uh, Gene and Tom and Dave Don Cooper. and Brad and Susan and... Uh, 
Golly, we got just a whole bunch of red dirt royalty in here tonight, and it's all about Bob Childers. We're here to remember him and to hear some, maybe some good Bob Childers stories and some great Bob Childers tunes, too. So, stick around. Why don't you guys kick us off with a song? If Tom Skinner embodies Oklahoma's generosity and sense of humor, and Randy Crouch exemplifies raw and passionate musical ability, then Bob Childers is the personification of spirituality of Red Dirt Music. They didn't call him the godfather of Red Dirt Music for nothing. There's a song Bob did, Woka Hey, which by his own interpretation and in Indian saying, supposedly translates to, today is a good day to die. And if you know your own soul, then any day is a good day to die. And Bob lived that all the way to the end. Woka hey. I think even the people that knew how important he was didn't know how important he was to everybody. Mm. To me, Bob was the great uh, glue that was holding the, the true red dirt thing together. He just left a big hole in the whole, the whole thing. You don't have to use big words to say big things. I, I really like the just simple, straightforward language. I think that might be the most important thing I learned from Woody Guthrie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a calling. I'll go ahead and say it. What the heck? Something gets in your brain somewhere a seed along the way, and it will not leave you alone. Believe me, I have tried to quit this so many times <laughs> and just have a normal life. <laughs> but... In the long run, it's been fantastic. All the good things in my life have come through music. When I was a kid and driving a tractor out here in these fields, you know, you get your uh, plow into a bunch of semi-moist or wet clay or red dirt, and it's gonna bog down a stick and you're stuck. When it's dry, it's it's powdery and dusty. And if you ever hit the back roads out around Stillwater, that's what you'll find, you know, just this real deep orange, orange earth. And, you know, you see a plowed field of that, and um, it's in your blood, I guess. <laughs> People will say, why Stillwater? Well, my theory is that Stillwater always has a constant, every year, a new influx of talent, young kids coming to school up there. So you've always got new ideas coming to town, yet the town itself at that time was so small that you couldn't avoid each other. They had backgrounds in music and, and literature, and um, it just was kind of all came together, you know, and something really beautiful came out of it. But yeah, that's where I first, you know, started just meeting people like, uh, you know, uh, the Childers and the Skinners and Jacobs. And Lefebvre. You know, at that time, he was the big guy of, of quote-unquote red dirt music, you know. He would come back and have these big uh, reunion weekends at, at Willie's, and, you know, and then it kind of, you know, then it, sh you know, it shifted. I kept playing there. At, I played at Willie's for like 15 years. Garth Brooks, would he lived around there. He was just a young kid, several years younger than us, but he'd come out to our gigs, and we'd, we were always pretty good about getting people up wanted to sing, you know, and let him do a few songs. He was pretty good. He was doing some solo gigs, and he decided he, he wanted to join Tom Skinner's band, just like me and everybody else that was here. We all wanted to be in Tom Skinner's band. So Garth was persistent, kept after him, and he joined the band. And um, they decided at one point they are going to move to Nashville, going to go try to go make it. So they load the band, 
Everybody heads out. They got a place to live out there. And Garth stayed, I think, for 48 hours is the story. 24 or 48, I can't remember. But he came home. It just wasn't for him. He just thought he was too intimidated. You know, Nashville was a business town, I found, at that time. There wasn't a whole lot of music played there. It was, uh, that's where the business was done. It may be different now, but at that time, you know, the musicians would come back to Nashville and maybe the, at the A level would record. Garth showed up again in about a year and said, man, uh, you know, I'm, I'm back, let's try it again. Well, they all had been there long enough and said, we're going home, you know, this ain't for us. And Garth said, you know, listen, man, stay. There's some things that I think are gonna happen. And this is just my understanding. Um, they said, no, we're going home. Well, they came home and the rest is history. Something did happen. <laughs> came back home and I made the right choice. You know, I wanted my boy to know his grandma and grandpa. And, and uh, came back home and, you know, played music all these years around here with people I love and, and glad to play with. So I made the right choice, you know, for me. If you ask Garth Brooks, I guarantee, and he's quoted as saying, he wouldn't have made it without the, the Stillwater sound that he took to Nashville and what he got from Tom Skinner and the band and Bob Childers. When, when Garth moved back to uh, Nashville the second time, he and his wife Sandy lived with Bob for the first few weeks until they were able to kind of get their feet on the ground. Bob introduced him to a lady by the name of Stephanie Brown, who introduced him to the head of Capitol Records, and the rest was history. So Bob and Tom were both pivotal guys in Garth's career. I have a tape of Garth singing a Bob Childers song that, called The Luck of the Draw, which is pretty much a, what Gert Garth turned into that rodeo song of his. Here's another copy of The Current. We got Stoney on this one. We got Cross Canadian on this one. Of course, this month we got Bruce Springsteen, so it's not that we only do Red Dirt, but it's just a part of our life. <laughs> I used to I used to always say, if you haven't been in Stillwater, then you couldn't be Red Dirt, but, you know, I don't know. But now it's, I'm down here and I see all the influence of it. And yeah, a lot of people think that these guys are, even that I'm from here in Texas. This is like a whole melting pot area right here, Chris. It was crossroads of America, really, in a certain degree. In the entire state of Oklahoma, the population is approximately equal to the Dallas-Fort Worth metropolitan area. So you've got kind of a critical mass issue there, too, you know? There's only so many fans in this state. And that also highlights just how extraordinary it is that so many great musicians come out of here out of such a small population base. During their formative years, the children of Oklahoma are surrounded by music. The air they breathe is scented with melody, and they inherit these ancestral sounds just as naturally as they walk and talk. Dustin and Jesse, uh, you know, there's, there's just two of many around here. They're just young, young, extremely talented kids. It's just, it's great to see. I knew how to play when I showed up to Tulsa and everything other than that they've taught me. Uh, just how to think about music, how to write, not necessarily technical musical stuff, um, but as far as songwriting and my attitude towards music is what I've learned the most from them. For both of us, we kind of were welcomed into the whole Science Project group, which is Tom Skinner and Rocky and all those guys, and Don. That was one of the first steps. Yeah, they're the, they're the new. The new crop coming up, carrying on the tradition, so. In rural Oklahoma, names like John Fulbright and Monica Taylor are set to become an international reference in folk music. She's fabulous, you know, you know, absolutely fabulous. Uh, what a treat to hear her play on Prairie Home Companion, which, uh, has been her lifelong dream for all the years I've ever known her. She turned me on to Garrison Keeler and Prairie Home Companion. And by golly, this year she did it by invitation. I'm so proud of her. One last night on Rocky Frisco's couch before I go back to London. It's never easy for me to leave Oklahoma. And each time I return, another one of these great musicians and mentors is gone. But the outlook is bright and a new generation of Okies will continue this timeless tradition. 
Indifferent to prevailing trends, their musical legacy, forged in the distant past, will be the shape of things to come for successive generations. Here I found my musical roots and my reason for playing on. I found it in the smoky bars of Tulsa and in the urban red dirt institution that is the Wednesday Night Science Project. I found it in the enlightened spirit of a people who wear their hearts on their sleeves and care little for the material world. And at last, like those whose strength of mind keeps this music and the Red Dirt community thriving, I found it in my inner self. International Blues Challenge winner for 2009, Little Joe McLaren. Yeah. Round.